uh, say that uh, that Irena, Irena, um, Irena lectured at the interdisciplinary uh, doctoral studies of the University of Arts in Belgrade. Uh, and he's um, uh, the author of many uh, different works and uh, her book, uh, her book uh, titled The Swinian 1990s, Theory and Social Reality of Serbia. Uh, and now we, uh, she, uh, she will present a paper, Four Decades of Recycling the Images of Socialist Past, the Case of Leibach. Am I right, Leibach? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I, I hope you uh, hear me well. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to thank Professor Bugin and his dedicated team for putting together this uh, wonderfully engaging conference. I especially enjoyed the, this morning session, so I'm really thankful for the quality time of Zoom, which is uh, often the case. So uh, time is precious. Uh, I'm starting to uh, introducing to you to the Leibach phenomenon. So Leibach described themselves as a music and cross media group from Slovenia, which has developed a Gesamt Kunstwerk, a multidisciplinary art practice in all fields ranging from popular culture to art, producing concerts and performances, posters, graphics, paintings, videos, installations, and many other things, of course. While exploring the, re uh, the relationships between art and ideology, uh, Leibach have appropriated a vi a symbolically charged language of visual communication, which encompasses an eclectic assemblage of provocative and often uh, ambiguous uh, artistic, uh, totalitarian, and religious visual references, often relying on their shock value. Uh, since their beginnings, the group was associated and surrounded with controversy, provoking strong reactions from political authorities of former Yugoslavia and in particular in the Socialist Republic of Slovenia. The spectacular changes in their uneasy cohabitation with the institutional framework and cultural mainstream of their home country in 40 years of Leibach's existence was celebrated last year with a series of events in Ljubljana and their hometown of Trbovje. So, uh, Leibach were formed on uh, 1st of June 1980 in this small industrial town in central Slovenia. As starting points for their work, Leibach cited the models of industrial production and totalitarianism, collectivism, and member anonymity, focusing on identification with ideology or over identification, which is a term coined by Slava Zizek, uh, who was a long time supporter and the occasional critic of the group. Uh, Leibach's industrial aesthetics has always emphasized the group's origins and referred to the working class and revolutionary traditions of Trbovje. However, with Leibach, industry appears as a specter from a nightmarish archetypal past, rather than the promise of a gleaming technocratic future. Leibach was originally a member group of the interdisciplinary artistic collective Neue Slovenische Kunst, NSK. They were part of a community which took collectivism seriously and which operated within a broader alternative cultural scene of civil society movements in Slovenia, engaged in the critique of the established socialist order and working towards the overall democratization of socialist Yugoslavia. Uh, Leibach was among the three founding members of NSK, together with the theater group uh, Scipio Nasica Sisters Theater, and the visual arts group Irvin. The three groups founded the NSK design department, New Collectivism, followed by other subdivisions, including the theoretical department of pure and applied philosophy, uh, led by philosopher Peter Mlakar. The name uh, Neue Slovenische Kunst alluded to Junge Slovenische Kunst, the title of a 1929 special issue of the German avant-garde journal Der Sturm featuring young Slovenian art. The collective's German name 
challenge the trauma of a more than 1,000 years of German political and cultural hegemony over the small Slovenian nation with its eclectic iconography largely borrowed from the past from Eastern and Western European avant-garde movements to socialist and uh, national socialist realism. NSK called attention to a society of discipline and collectivism, which was dying out together with its apparatus, only to fall prey to the far superior forces of capital with its all encompassing technological control. NSK differed from the Western appropriation art in that it appropriated the state itself and official institutions with its events. According to NSK, both the state and its institutions uh, needed to be constructed anew, which in reality happened in Slovenia with the dissolution of Yugoslavia in 1991. One, the more the state is falling as a public authority, the stronger the various nationalisms and uh, neo-Nazi uh, fascisms uh, emerge on the both sides of the former Iron, Iron Curtain. The more the real power of global capital grows, individual states uh, cling more desperately to their national symbols. NSK and Leibach underscored all this, making evident that uh, Nazi slash fascism had never been conquered on the mundane level. National states are left holding the symbols of authority as empty signifiers of a bygone era. Accordingly, after the breakup of Yugoslavia and the establishment of the independent Slovenian state, the NSK groups joined forces in founding the NSK uh, State in Time. Since then, the NSK, uh, NSK State in Time has issued passports, had its own visual identity and symbols, opened embassies and consulates in countries all over the world, and has far surpassed the Vatican in the number of citizens. A member of Leibach were among the first holders of its passport. Uh, Leibach's symbolically charged language of uh, visual communication encompasses an eclectic uh, assemblage of artistic, totalitarian, and religious visual references. For example, uh, the so-called Leibach cross and other crosses, including swastika, images of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, or Josip Broz Tito, speeches by Winston Churchill, JFK or Reagan, uh, hunting club regulations, cogwheels and rats, mounted hawks, stag antlers, locusts, sculptured war heroes, Teutonic script, uh, the Prussian eagle, Aryan families and gy gymnasts, etc. Uh, from the typically Slovenian hayrack kozolet, uh, partisan songs, uh, national anthems, old maps of Europe, maps of international time zones or UN and NATO insignia to references to Kazimir Malevich, Edward Munch, John Hartfield, Joseph Beuys, Anselm Kiefer or Gilbert and George. These are just some of the more recognizable motives that Leibach appropriated and repeatedly used throughout their career. As for Yugoslavia, the Black Cross was not only a recognizable symbol for Leibach's core audience, but something that the wider part of the population was coming to know and in many cases genuinely fear. On the album Nova Acropola <clears throat> in 1986, Leibach's militant classicism combined with industrial noise and samples from contemporary classical and film music induced a sublime terror. According to the practice of contemporary industrial music bands, in, their, work, in uh, their earlier works, they used sounds and images as tools to provoke fear and fascination. Leibach transformed even love, the major signifier of pop ideology, into a demonic totalitarian force, resurrecting uh, past terrors as a retroactive warning of things to come, and which indeed came with the wars in former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. <clears throat> Leibach's early history in socialist Yugoslavia was one of provocative behavior, censorship, and police, police records. When asked why uh, they were wearing Yugoslav army uniforms and using means of combat, bat, uh, of combat uh, namely smoke bombs, at their concerts, Leibach answered that they were working on a war-related subject matter. 
After an exhibition of Leibach Kunst uh, in 1983, the members of Leibach were escorted to the railway station in Zagreb, Croatia by the police and told to go and display their beautiful creations elsewhere. The appearance of Leibach at the Zagreb Music Biennial in the same year meant another large-scale inter-republic scandal for Leibach, followed by a media witch hunt, uh, because during the performance, a pornographic scene was repeatedly projected over images of Josip Rotz Tito, leader of socialist Yugoslavia. Uh, the name Leibach first appeared in 1144 as the original name of Ljubljana, capital of Slovenia, then in the era of the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy, and finally in 1943 at the time of the German occupation of Yugoslavia. The controversy around the name and the group's provocation reached its peak in 1983 when they appeared at the program TV Weekly, broadcast on national TV. They stage a controversial appearance after which the host journalist uh, successfully called for a political lynching of the group. Eventually, the presidency of the Ljubljana City Committee of the Socialist Alliance of Working People of Yugoslavia passed a resolution to the effect that the German name of the group was inappropriate, that the group's use of it had no legal basis, and contravened the ordinance of the proper use of the coat of arms, the flag, and the name of the city of Ljubljana. A formal ban of all public manifestations of the group under the name of Leibach, uh, reg registered in the official Gazette of the Republics of Slovenia, remained in effect until February 1987. There is a funny uh, story about Leibach's later uh, 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 encounter with this journalist, but I will have to skip it. I'm already uh, running too long. Uh, while banned from performing under the name Leibach in Slovenia, the members of the group took part in co uh, composing the music for the NSK uh, theater production uh, Baptism under Triglav, uh, directed by Dragan Živadino, uh, one of the most representative and expensive theater productions for the emergent uh, independent Slovenian state. In this period, Leibach uh, began to invade the realms of high culture and big public budgets through the back doors of rehearsal rooms in theaters and Philharmonic halls. So, uh, back in Ljubljana, uh, to celebrate the first legal Alaiva concert after the five year ban, they played recorded partisan songs outside the hall and German songs from the same period inside the venue. Pionirski uh, Dom. In the late uh, 1980s, Leibach tested the Yugoslav audience's endurance with cultural and political provocations, like recorded excerpts from national speeches by Slobodan Milosevic and Gusle, folk instrument holding a special place in Serbian cultural heritage, played at the concert in Zagreb. In Belgrade, Peter Mlaker would address the audience, paraphrase, paraphrasing uh, Slobodan Milosevic, while a Third Reich film entitled The Bombing of Belgrade ran in the background. From uh, 1983 onwards, uh, Leibach had a long record of performing outside of Yugoslavia, both in the West and in the East of Europe. But their true international success commenced in 1986 when the famed British label Mute Records signed them and released their album Opus Dei. In the subsequent year, uh, period, <laughs> this album was a shift from industrial sounds and militant classicism into a more communicative and uh, apparently populist sound. At the time when Leibach disclosed unexpected affinities for Kraftwerk, uh, Motorhead and Queen, a Britain's communist newspaper, The Morning Star, called them the soldiers of freedom. Other parts of the British media focused on the parody aspects of Leibach's uh, so-called new originals, uh, cover versions of Anglo-Saxon rock classics and second-rate European acts. Transcending the mediocrity of the original works, Leibach's new originals uh, imposed uh, an ironically epic and heroic tone, challenging Western assumptions about Eastern artists' uh, inferiority by producing something more sophisticated and multi-layered <clears throat> than the actual originals. 
uh, more craft work than craft work or Rammstein for adults. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> In the meantime, <clears throat> Leiber have achieved the status of probably the most recognizable pop cultural phenomenon of Slovenia. So we are making a big leap uh, in time <clears throat> to summer uh, 2015 when the whole world <clears throat> was made aware that for the first time in its history the Dem Democratic People's uh, Republic of Korea would invite the Western rock band to play in the country and that it would be no other act than Leibach. The performances were planned as part of the celebration of the 70th anniversary of Korea's liberation from Japanese colonial rule, which was described uh, by Leibach's spokesman Ivan Novak as a small step for Leibach and a big step for humanity. In the Western media, Leibach were mainly presented as a highly controversial band originating from the former communist East and going to North Korea to entertain a brainwashed and utterly unpredictable audience in the supposedly most totalitarian and isolated society in the world. Even then, Leibach were described as mildly notorious for flirting satirically with fascist imagery. Such reception of Leibach on the part of the Western media was voiced by comedian John Oliver, who mocked the Korean mission in HBO's last week tonight, saying, North Korea seems like a terrifying place to visit, but if it's really true that that guy, <clears throat> Milan Fras, lead singer of Leibach, is going to be singing the sound of music, I kind of want to go there. On their part, uh, Leibach openly <clears throat> expressed their simultaneous fascination with and distance from the North Korean political utopia. In their home country, Slovenia, Leibach's North Korean expedition stirred the public debate about the band's moral compass, informed by local knowledge of their history and st uh, strategies of artistic provocation, which were largely lacking in the media coverage from the rest of the world. Moreover, Slovenian, uh, Slovenian media put great emphasis on the episode with the Korean censors, whose interventions on the playlist and other aspects of the performance were reported in depth, including other forms of restrictions imposed on Leibach by their hosts. The reason for such attention paid to the issue of censorship was perhaps best described by uh, journalist uh, Jure Tepina, Censorship is part of their stage performance, their work, their essence. The more apparatchiks uh, watch their steps, the happier Leibach are. Finally, someone started to take them seriously again, because in a democracy, it is rather difficult to offend anyone and get censored. In this debate, Leibach from their youth were represented as both praising and subverting, even demolishing the communist regimes in Eastern Europe, Slovenia included, depending on the political perspective of the beholder. As ambassadors of democracy, Leibach were seen in the same role as Wham in the middle 1980s, who were the first international pop attraction allowed to perform in China only 30 years later. Some commentators also saw Leibach in the same mission as Yugoslav performers of light music who toured the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain. In an interview promoting uh, Ugi Solte and Morten Travik's documentary Liberation Day, which follows Leibach on their trip to North Korea, Slavoj Žižek referred to Leibach's North Korean expedition as the most fascinating cultural and ideological political event of the 21st century, uh, concluding his statement as follows. Leibach is not simply making fun of totalitarianism, Laiva is bringing out, let's call it the authoritarian feature, which is present in all societies, even the most democratic. The person responsible for the whole business of shipping out Laiva to North Korea, Norwegian theater and film director Morten Travik, opined that with their uh, performance in North Korea, they finally returned home to their natural habitat. On their part, Leibach disclosed that they went to North Korea for on-the-job training in a totalitarian regime, 
Namely, they said we went to Pyongyang for some on, some on the job training, as it were, because there is no other state in the world which so earnestly and openly assumes a totalitarian posture when it comes to the relation between art and ideology, politics and culture, respectively. We all know that COVID-19 was actually created to prevent Leibach from performing the anniversary show in Trboje in front of a physical audience, which is a situation similar to that of 40 years ago in the same space. And maybe this is the right way to commemorate the event from 40 years ago that did not happen, even though it did. This is how Leibach announced their 40th anniversary show in Trboje a series of music performances by Lyrach and their guests, including the Trbovje Workers' Line Orchestra, which would perform classic military and workers' marches and the formal address by His Holiness Peter Mlakar to the people of Trbovje and Lyrach for followers around the world. The event was prepared in the Lauski Dom, in the, the mythical venue of their first public performance that did not happen even though it did, because it was banned by the communist authorities. Announcing this program, the mainstream Slovenian media referred to Leibach as masters of provocation and a collective renowned for their spectacular performances, summing up politely and respectfully their role of celebrity artists and dis disgruntled critics, punk veterans and national symbols. On 19 October 2020, Slovenian authorities declared a 30-day nationwide state of emergency, which prevented Leibach from performing the anniversary uh, show in the Lavski Dom. Uh, so to conclude this long story, uh, Leibach's long march through the institutions uh, may be immensely helpful in answering the following question. In the present neoliberal context, how can contemporary artists from Central and Eastern Europe be globally successful and subversive at the same time? As for LIBA, however, there is no straightforward answer to these concerns. So I have to stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you very much, Irena. We uh, postpone our question uh, to the end of our panel and now Monica Puglia, correct me, please, if I wrong. Puglia. Can you repeat? Puglia. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Monica Puglia. I, I continue our discussion. Uh, your paper, your paper, uh, your Can paper titled, yeah, titled uh, Low Intensity Ideology, the Case of Off. Laga Disco Pax. Monica is uh, um, uh, uh, affiliated in uh, Sazari University. And uh, yes, Monica, please continue. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I would really thank uh, the organizers of the conference for their hard work and dedication. In my presentation, I'll talk about the work and the music of an Italian indie alternative band, probably completely unknown in Russia, whose name is Aflaga Disco Pax. I'll focus mainly on their lyrics and on their peculiar use of socialist keywords, realia, icons, to narrate the life in the suburbs of Emilia uh, Romagna, region in Italy. Um, in the 70s and in the 80s. In particular, we will analyze the first album uh, entitled Socialismo Tascabile. But first, uh, a bit of contextualization. Oflaga is not the first band in Italy that has been fascinated by Russian or Soviet culture. Here I reported the most famous bands and singers who sang about those topics, uh, but I assure that in the Italian underground, uh, you can find many more musicians. Uh, we have Angelo Branduardi with his violin, uh, whose song, Confessione di un malandrino, is inspired by Yesenin Ispoved Huligana. Then uh, Franco Battiato's songs, uh, Franco Battiato spent away uh, a month ago, uh, more or less. Uh, Prospetti Vanieschi and Alexander Platz, his songs uh, that remind uh, the listener symbolic places beyond the Iron Curtain, as their titles claim. Uh, if I would... Um, 
Uh, if, uh, if I can, I will also remember the song Mayakovsky uh, by Teatro degli Orrori, that is a sort of declamation accompanied by music of a famous Mayakovsky poem to his beloved self. The way of singing of uh, the singer of uh, Teatro degli Orrori is inspired by the outstanding Italian actor Carmelo Bene, who loved to read and perform in theater Mayakovsky's works. Before entering the main topic, I would like to introduce to you CCCP. Uh, then they will transform, as Soviet Union does, in a CSA. CCCP is the way in which uncultured Italians were used to pronounce SSSR, reading Cyrillic like Latin types. Their impact to Italian music was incredible. All the Italian rock alternative bands are in depth with them, Marlene Kunz after hours, and the Flaga Disco Pax, among the others. Inspired by bands like Kraftworks, Esserzun, the Neubaten, the Stooges, the Ramones, uh, Battiato, and the Bauhaus, uh, they subvert the Italian way to play rock. I'd like to underline the novelty they represent in Italy, melting together punk, oriental sound, folk, rebellion, and revolution, the mysticism of the land and the machine, in an original fusion of Emilian and Soviet mythology. CCCP was born as a band in Berlin when the lead singer Giovanni Lindo Ferretti met the, met the, the lead guitar Massimo Zamboni. The other members of the band joined them later. CCCP have a lot in common with Oflaga, the band on, on which I'm focusing on this presentation. They are uh, their ancestors for some, uh, in some way. Uh, first of all, their origins. Both bands are from Reggio Emilia, in Emilia Romagna. Second point, the clever use of, Sov of Soviet slogans and realia. Third point, the voice. Both singers use spoken words way of singing, declaiming a sort of mantra more raging and screamed in the singer Giovanni Lindo Ferretti of CCCP, and more dangling, ironic, and with a strong Emilian dialectal accent, uh, never disguised, in the way of singing uh, of Max Collini, the frontman of Flaga Disco Pax. The band CCCP, CSE, broke up in 2002, but from time to time they were born with a different name and new members. Now the leader and singer of the band, Giovanni Lindo Ferretti, after overcoming cancer, changed, changed completely his mind and converted himself into a right-wing uh, supporter. Here you can see some of their album covers. You can see the mix of Western icons like Coca-Cola font used to write uh, um, uh, CCCP uh, that reminds some works of Moscow conceptualists. In the first two cover, uh, starting from the left, you can see some keywords of the party like orthodoxy or uh, slogans like faithful to the party line. And, uh, and also in the green uh, album cover, uh, you can see uh, the picture, a picture of uh, Palmiro Togliatti. Uh, see, and um, the title of the album is Similarities and Divergences Between Comrade Togliatti and us. In socialism and barbarity, the famous logo of Italian car um, manufacturing uh, Fiat is filled up with uh, um, the name CCCP. Now let's see why communism and Soviet Union were so important in Italy, in particular in Reggio Emilia suburbs, and also why I'm presenting this topic. This is a conference about socialist culture recycled in post-Soviet countries. Well, Italy is not a post-Soviet country, but the PCE, Italian Communist Party, was the biggest communist party in Western Europe, reaching the very top of consensus after the sudden death of its leader Enrico Berlinguer in 1984. PC was one of the main forces during the struggle for freedom from fascism and nazism in Italy, and definitely the more organized and decisive. Uh, fascism and communism grew in Italy in the same cradle, the Po River Valley, Tuscany and Emilia region. Uh, that had on its territory uh, both the disease and its antibodies. Uh, the Gothic Line, a German defensive line built by Nazis in the, Appen in, in, in the Apennines Mountains between Tuscany and Emilia, was the set for a lot of harsh battles and fights, and after the end of the Second World War, it turned into one of the symbols of the epic fights against Nazist and fascist enemy, and also, in the end, a symbol of the final victory. PG, as, the, as a, its party secretary, uh, some of the most important thinkers and politicians of, uh, of the country. Just to mention uh, both of them, uh, Antonio Gramsci and Palmiro Togliatti. Emilia, and also Tuscany, of course, were the stronghold of the Communist Party that was, use, uh, that was used to win election, often with the landslide majority. Emilia was, uh, as we said, uh, in the Po River Valley, the heart of Italian manufacturing. Therefore, it had always had the strong organized movements in defense of workers. 
Uh, the Germany of Communist Party, as we can see with the uh, CCCP, influences also Italian music, and, it's part and in particular, the music of Oflaga Disco Pax. Let's start from, uh, from their name. It's quite absurd. Oflaga is a city near Brescia, whose funny name, uh, because in Italian mm, it sounds quite funny and, un and unusual, trust me, uh, struck the singer uh, Mascolini, who proposed uh, it as the name of the band. The second part of the name, Disco Pax, came from a song by Mambos, a situationist band from Reggio Emilia. Here on the bottom right of the slide, you can see their logo. The members of the band are Mascolini, Voices and Lyrics, Enrico, Fortane Enrico Fontanelli, who died in... Uh, 2014, and whose death was the reason why the band uh, finally broke up. Uh, he used, uh, Fontanelli used to play bass guitar, Moog and piano, and Daniele Caretti, who used to play uh, bass guitar and guitar. Uh, they defined themselves as a, a neo-sensibilist collective against the democracy of feelings. They are not easy to put into some music classification, but uh, let's try. It's something among electronic, post-rock, new wave, and we can define Maxolini's way of uh, singing as spoken words. Undoubtedly, they were used to listen uh, to songs by Massimo Volume, CCCP, Kraftworks, and Suicide. Here I wrote down their main works. Uh, they released in 2006, Socialismo Tascabile, Trove Tecniche di Trasmissione, in English, uh, Pocket Socialism, Technical Proof of Transmission. In, two uh, in 2008, uh, they released uh, Bacchelite, Bacchelite, that it was uh, the first plastic made from synthetic components. And during uh, um, uh, the, uh, the recording of Bacchelite, uh, they uh, will shoot the documentary of Flaga Disco Pax documentary uh, by the director Pierre Nosari. In uh, 2012, uh, they released the last, uh, uh, their last album, Gioco di Società, in English, Board Game, but sadly in translation it's quite, um, it's quite hard to understand the pun. It's like a game of society, uh, literally. <laughs> Uh, this is the cover of Socialismo Tascabile, the album on, on whose lyrics uh, we will focus today. Uh, its tracks list uh, is made up of nine songs, uh, Kepler, Enver, Camer Rossa, Cinnamon, uh, Tono Metallico Standard, Tatranchi, Robespierre, Piccola Pietroburgo e eh, De Fonseca. Uh, among uh, these uh, nine songs, uh, I have selected uh, these four in uh, yellow, Camer Rossa, Tatranchi, Robespierre, Piccola Pietroburgo. These four songs can be defined as short tales uh, from Emilian province, seen through the lens of uh, a faded dream of socialism. Uh, here I've gathered different topics that emerges uh, in, in the songs using different colors in order to make uh, the reading of Italian lyrics uh, easier. Uh, here you can see the topics I have selected, uh, Emilia and Italian in places in blue, Russian Soviet countries in places in red, historical figures um, in, uh, in green, uh, pop culture, realia uh, and icons in uh, pink, and Soviet communist realia and personalities in uh, yellow. Uh, here's some uh, photos, uh, the boost of Lenin, that is important in the next song, uh, the city of Oflaga, and uh, the Waffer Tatranchi. Now we see why I chose this, uh, this photo, this pixel. The first song is uh, Piccola Pietroburgo, uh, Little Petersburg, in translation. Okay. This song is a very melancholic one. It narrates the story of a dark metal boost of Lenin made in 1920 and donated by Communist Party of Soviet Union to the very small town of Cavriago near to Reggio Emilia. Max Collini, the singer, was born there. After explaining the story behind the Lenin statue, the lyrics introduce a legend, non confirmed by documents, according to which Lenin was, was and still is the honorary major of Cavriago. The statue is really there, as you can see from the photo in the last slide. Uh, the singer uh, made up an ongoing dialogue between the Italian or better Emilian suburbs and the Soviet Union. Uh, in the last part of the song here, 
Uh, it refers to a story uh, happened to um, in the city of Civita Vecchia in 1995. I believe that this uh, story was a big fraud uh, that um, involved and mocked Italian devout people who believe in the miracle of a blood crime statue of the Virgin Mary in, uh, in Civita Vecchia. It was a striking event in Italy. TV and mass media wrote and told a lot on this phenomenon. And then singer Collini, laughing at the stupidity of people, added to the story a peculiar conclusion. Conclusion. Even the bust of Lenin cried, thinking about the naivete of the faithful people, and the lead singer Collini quotes an hypothetic paper on Konsomoskaya Pravda. Uh, about uh, uh, this disappointing statue of Lenin near Reggio Emilia, who cried white tears, white as the boats in their Kangas harbor. The end of the song is powerful, and the final uh, climax is uh, touching. This is one of the main features of Flaga. A stinging irony mixed with a moving uh, lyricism capable of uh, uh, joining together Italian periphery with Soviet Union and um, capable of sparking the deepest feeling of uh, socialist nostalgia for events they have uh, never lived uh, happened uh, in places that uh, probably they never uh, they have never visited, like Anka Arkangas in the, in the ending of uh, this song. Lenin appears like a fetish of a forgotten region, far from the singer, almost as the Virgin. And both uh, Lenin and, um, and the Virgin uh, resemble something that belongs to the gilbiness of the simpletons. The second song is uh, Robespierre. And this is the most famous song of the album. Uh, it is a perfect example of the mix of pop icons and everyday stuff in Collini's memories of the 70s and, uh, and the 80s. It's a list of memories, uh, iconic objects, events, and characters. Historical figures like uh, Carlo Marx, Ho Chi Minh, Che Guevara, uh, become more real and uh, get closer to the mind of the singer because their names are the coordinates of, uh, of his childhood, being the same name of the well-known streets of his hometown. Here you can read uh, um, place names uh, like uh, Carlo Marx Road, Ho Chi Minh Road, Che Guevara Road, Dolores Ibaruri Road, Stalingrad Road, Tito Road, and uh, Lenin Square in Cavriago. This, uh, this is our... Um, uh, all the streets uh, in Caviago and Reggio Emilia. Um, uh, names uh, are settled in the imagination. Uh, they had entered everyday life, becoming familiar. The lyrics are nothing, uh, nothing more than a list of what was important for a teenager in Emilia in the 70s and in the 80s. Pop and Soviet name uh, and stuff are closer and alternated. You can see in pink um, pop icons uh, and uh, like uh, Anna Oxa, an Italian singer, uh, it, uh, Italian uh, Albanese singer, uh, the rock band Van Allen, uh, the, um, the comics uh, Zora, the porno vampire, uh, the um, uh, the book, the famous book in Italy uh, by Fogazzaro, or The Little World of the Past, then the Chocolate Toblerone, and all the places of uh, his youth. Uh, the singer uh, says, uh, socialism in 1975 was like the universe, was expanding. Uh, Alberto Vantoregna and uh, Armila Katakvilova are seated in the song as, um, as their victory uh, fed the hopes and dreams of people in this uh, self-appointed satellite of the Soviet Union. In the last line, it is shown the pride of Collini for his uh, neighborhood here, where Communist Party was used to win election with a 74% of majority, and the Christian Democracy, that was the most voted important, important Italian party after the, the end of the Second World War, defeated with only the 6%. Uh, as you can see from the colors in the slide, everyday life characters and events are alternated with communist realia and characters to show how they were melted in a confused egalitarian mix in the mind of an Emilian teenager. Uh, Khmer Rossa. Uh, this song, uh, Red Khmer, this song narrates a romantic first love. This is a bright example of the way in which a teenager lived this, uh, lived this um, love story, seeing uh, everything through the eye of socialism. The loved girl is described here as a riot, un tumulto. 
that sounds uh, very revolutionary. Collini thinks that uh, the girl saw him like a Dimitrov or like a Mayakovsky and not like a cheap nanny or cheap Turati that were not communist or, uh, nor uh, revolutionaries, but only socialist and moderates. He imagines uh, their first time together and uh, the time is measured for uh, an entire October revolution. She was like his Rosa Luxemburg uh, and uh, their heart was beating like in Stalingrad. The first time together has to be irrevocable as the 25th of April. The liberation uh, that uh, the 25th of April is the liberation day in Italy, the liberation from Nazism and uh, fascism. Everything in the life of the narrator is compared with socialism. Every word is resignified. Rosa Luxemburg is not a party leader or a thinker, but the highest ideal of woman, like in Chervengur by Platonov. Beauty is comparable only to liberation from fascism. Emotion can be measured only by the heartbeat in Stalingrado Besiege. Uh, the last song I, uh, I choose is uh, uh, Tatranki. The main topic of the song is the city of Prague. Seeing Prague for the narrator voice is painful. He sings uh, Praga is a city where nothing survives. Prague doesn't reflect the dream of the socialist Prague the narrator had in his mind. The symbols of the regime were cancelled and he saw a kind of naked city that had refused its past. And Collini regrets that the time in which there were some uh, uh, differences between East and West are not only um, and, and not only a uh, sort of appropriation made by the West by means of money, uh, rather than uh, in a Soviet way with uh, thanks. Uh, a rapacious West that had uh, bought everything in a greedy appropriation of econs of a country, like uh, um, when uh, uh, Skoda manufacturing uh, was bought, or Tatranki. Tatranki uh, are a typical waffles brand that was bought by a big Western manufacturing, uh, Danone. Uh, the song ends with a sorrowful um, sentence. Uh, they, took, uh, they took us, uh, they took everything from us. In that as uh, is hidden all the bitterness for a world that uh, uh, what is appearing and for uh, a sort of shared defeat. In the middle of the song appears Felicità, uh, an Italian song by Albano e Romina, in, Itali in English, uh, happiness. Uh, Albano e Romina are a couple of Italian singers, uh, very famous in Italy, and I think in Russia too. Uh, icons of pop music and even of uh, gossip trash. Uh, Felicità uh, sounds like a positive, uh, a positive sunny song uh, that represented the apex of their career and maybe uh, of, a, of their love as well. Uh, Albano e Romina were married. Uh, the two singers... Sì. Sorry, I have to remind us about time. You have a couple of minutes. Okay, I think I will uh, finish. Uh, I will finish. Uh, the two singers, in fact, after a fairy tale love divorce, when their young daughter went missing. Well, Felicità, seen as a wider phenomenon, depicts the mood of the song, a dream of happiness unrealized and definitely lost. Far by real, in conclusion, far uh, by real ideology, socialism represents in Oflaga's lyrics something connected with memories from childhood and teen years, and with a specific mood that was perceivable in Italy at the end of the 70s and all along the 80s, and that now is full of a sense of nostalgia for something unrealized, maybe not true communism, but a kind of social justice and widespread wealth. Everything is filtered and seen uh, through the disenchantment of the day after the end, when everything seems only an undistinguished dream, uh, made mixed and confused through the postmodern sensibility. The letter deconstructs everything and then pastes uh, the pieces, gluing the higher level with the lower, a pivotal painful historical phenomenon with pop culture. The use of reality and icons is not only a way to evoke uh, uh, ideological connotated objects or political slogans, as every Soviet word and object is uh, traced back in the memories and connected to the crucial events for, uh, from the adolescence of the narrator voice, Max Collini, and of his generation. Above all, they bitterly, uh, they bitterly depict something irreparably lost, observed at the same time, at the same time with tenderness, irony, and sarcasm. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Monica. And now our discussion, um, uh, Antonio Gr uh, Grigic, Antonio, correct my pronunciation if I'm, I'm 
mistaken um, from the uni uh, from the institute of architectural theory art history and cultural studies uh, of uh, the university of technology of graz uh, will present the paper retrotopia retrotopia through music revitalization uh, revitalization of forgotten yugoslav socialist monuments uh, as musical instruments for participatory concert concerts in public space please antonio thank you valeri for introduction so this is retrotopia to music, reutilization of forgotten Yugoslav socialist monuments as musical instruments for participatory concert in public space. Monuments from the time of socialist Yugoslavia have been the subject of increased interest of the Western cultural public in the past last few years. One of the many reasons for this is the fact that they are sublime objects of ideology. The sub sublime object of the ideology is a new philosophical concept introduced by the most famous philosopher from the former Yugoslavia, Slavo Žižek, in his book published in 1989, just before the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the USSR, and the destruction of Yugoslavia. Slavo Žižek describes the nature of this object in his books of the same title through the interpretation of the photographs of the remaining of the Titanic on the ocean floor. But everything Slavo Žižek said about the scattered remains of the Titanic shipwreck on the ocean floor can be also applied to monuments built during socialist Yugoslavia, especially those built in a socialist realistic style. They are the sublime object of ideology par excellence. The ideology that built them promised the fulfillment of utopia, but it never delivered that promise. Monuments as an art form were the medium and mediator of that ideology. Even during the Second World War, while fighting for the absolute political power on the territory of the former Yugoslavia, the Yugoslav Communist Party planned the ideological transformation of society through art as one of its future political levers. The communist leader of the Yugoslav partisan movement, Josip Broz Tito, was a pre-war Moscow cadre, and in, in accordance with the time and the place of his political education, he shaped the artistic theory and practice of the future Yugoslavia. In this plan, the removal of the undesirable and the construction of the new monuments in the place played an important role in accordance with the Soviet revolutionary model, namely with the Lenin's plan for monumental propaganda. It was a political strategy proposed by Vladimir Lenin, Anatoly Lonacharsky and Stalin of employing monumental as visual monumental art in the form of revolutionary slogans and a sculpture for pro propagating revolutionary communist idea. In a country with a high rate of illiteracy and without a developed media industry, monuments in the form of monumental sculpture and mass spectacles became medium for propaganda for a new ideology, a kind of Biblia paupera for illiterate masses. At the beginning, these new revolutionary monuments which are celebrating the great days of the Russian Socialist Revolution, took live form. The monumental sculpture was often part of the scenography for the revolutionary mass festivals, all mass spectacles. These were staged political and cultural events held in public venues and participatory in its essence. Mass spectacles were medium for a promotion of newly established Marxist-Leninist ideology and creation of historical myths initially wrapped into the also newly established aesthetic of the Russian avant-garde. But in the 1930s, socialist realism took precedence over constructivism, futurism, and cubism in the USSR. So, after taking power in Yugoslavia in 1945, under the influence of its political mentor in Moscow, the Communist Party of Yugoslavia established socialist realism as a dominant style in art, and especially in the production of political monuments. But the geopolitical situation changed fundamentally in 1948, when Yugoslavia separated from the USSR and the Eastern Bloc due to the conflict Tito with Stalin. Soon after, the Yugoslavia gradually abandoned socialist realism and took over the Western model of art, leaving socialist realism as a relic of rejected artistic and political conception. With the disintegration of Yugoslavia in the 90s, monuments from the socialist era were destroyed en masse. Socialist realist monuments were particularly under attack due to their recognizable style and explicit symbolism. After, the demolition was not completed, so the monuments remain in place, but with 
missing limbs or holes from explosives. In recent years, a group of artists from Croatia started to organize participatory concerts on the socialist realist monuments located in public spaces in the city of the former Yugoslavia. With this concert, monuments are being transformed into a musical instrument, but also the scenography of the concert. They are being surrounded with, with microphones, and the gutter spectators and passers-by are given the opportunity to participate in the percussion concert, using the monuments as an instrument and thus creating a kind of experimental industrial music composition. Namely, since the monuments are made of bronze with an empty interior, they act as an excellent and unique instrument of high sound quality. The sound of, that the monuments produces is transmitted from the microphone to the mixer, where the sound designer moderates the sounds, thus obtaining a kind of very experimental composition in the former, which lingers between noise, electro, and industrial music. Each monument has a unique shape, so each of these compositions is also unique. The reaction of, to this action by the public and the media are very good. One of the reasons is that the public is rediscovering monuments that have long been forgotten, and utopia in today's time devoid of any ideas and utopias. Robert Musa said us that nothing is more invisible than a monument is well known. Monuments are paradoxical objects that are created in such a way that they stand out in place, but with time, they become completely invisible. The only time monuments are visible is when they are erected or when they are demolished. This is especially true in the case of the monuments on which the first concert of this series was done in 2020. The name of the monument is the Shooting of the Hostages by the sculptor Prano Kršinić and is located in the center of Zagreb, capital of Croatia. Since 1954, this monument has been standing in Zagreb. It is a quite large, but in spite of that, almost invisible. The vast majority of Zagreb residents who pass it by on a daily basis are not aware of its existence. When microphones are placed around such invisible monuments and the speakers start producing sound in a public space, people start gathering. The monuments all of a sudden become visible and the distance between the monuments and the ordinary mundane life established by the pedestal of the monuments is lost. People are starting noticing the monuments, gather around them and they start playing on them, in a way playing with them. The fact that the best sounds come from the open bound wounds on the human body shaped in the socialist heroic style carries an additional poetic note to these concerts, which are at the same time an act of affirmation, but also an echo of the polit political iconoclasm that was done on these monuments in the 1990s. But what is interesting about this concert on socialist realistic monuments in the 91st in the 21st century is the procedure of using progressive artistic practice. After 100 years, there is a return to participatory avant-garde performative art, but no new scenography is being built in the style of con constructivism, cubism, or futurism, as was in case with Nathan Altman in Petrograd, Elisitsky, Tatlin, Alexander Vesnin, and Lyubov Petrova. Instead, socialist-style monuments are used, which is a kind of negation of the Russian avant-garde altogether. Due to the appropriation of existing monuments in the socialist realistic style, this concept can be interpreted as a continuation of original artistic direction in Yugoslavia that appeared in the decade before its disintegration, the retro avant-garde. My colleague Irena spoke about it earlier. This paradoxical term of retro avant-garde appeared for the first time in 1983 at the Leibach Kunst exhibition in the Škuts Gallery in Ljubljana, capital of Slovenia. This exhibition presented Leibach hard works and was named Ausstellung Leibach Kunst, Monument, Monumental Retro Avangarda. To quote Tyros Miller, the retro avant-garde semantic field has been defined by the range of postmodern and mostly post-socialist art practices that draw formal, philosophical, and social inspiration from the politicized, powerfully utopian avant-garde of the early decades of the 20th century, especially in the USSR and East Central Europe. For example, the following manifesto by the Slovene art group Irvin figured the post-communist legacy of the Cold War's East-West geopolitical divide in terms of alternative temporal zone in which the arts of the 20th century exhibit significantly different rhythms and narratives of, of development. In the former East, this temporality authorized or even compelled an artistic return to the avant-garde of the past, 
which had never been allowed to play out their historical potential fully. The contemporary artists could help release these untappled utopian energies of the past while utilizing them creatively in historically and ideologically problematic present. As artists from the East, we, we claim that it's impossible to annual several decades of experience of the East and to neutralize its vital potential, end of quote. Thus, this concert on socialist realistic monuments in the 21st century are a continuation of the procedures of retro avant-garde from the 1980s. After 100 years, there is a return to participatory avant-garde performative art also, but now without the collectivist quasi-totalitarian foundation, namely Laiba and early mentioned Irvin and other art groups, which were the part of the Neue Slovenische Kunst movement, were closed collectives, in the most case, close to participatory art forms. In the case of monuments as instruments, this is exactly what is required, the participation of casual passerby. There is a group of artists leading the project, but this group does not have a collective name, and it is only serving as a platform for a preparation of the condition for the participatory concert, where public is a main protagonist. These concerts are an, are an echo of avant-garde participatory mass spectacles in post-revolutionary Russia, but also, also retro avant-garde Leibach concert in the in 1980s in disagreeing Yugoslavia. Now I will uh, show you the photos from this concert. This is the monuments I was talking about. Uh, I should have a uh, share screen, okay. So do you see the photos? Not yet. Not yet. Uh huh. Okay. So you are now seeing, yeah? Just a moment. Yes, we see. Okay. This is the concert in Zagreb. As you can see, this is the the shooting of the hostages. So we put the microphones around the monuments. Wonderful. Yeah. So there is also a christological aura around it you know with this spear in a in a in a uh, this is like a instrument but it's looking like a spear in a, a jesus christ ribs yeah so this is like how it looks like so there is this combination of of modern and and socialist realist so you, see, you can see these monuments are especially in in in, uh, in area which it was not prone to so socialist realism so it started re really abruptly so the the artists were not really uh keen to 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 the style no so and this is the liba also using this socialist realist uh and nazi iconography also this this is the album Nova Acropola or Slovenska Acropola, Irene also mentioned it, so you can see this relief which is uh, 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 behind the uh, Plechnik's uh, Cathedral of Light, which is called uh, Architecture of Plan for Slovenian Parliament. So this use of, of socialist realist and Nazi style is what is, uh, what is connecting these, these two art projects, which are part of different eras so this is how it looks before the concerts this preparation so these are microphones there is a mix mixette there are there are the speakers and so when the music starts the the, the people gather and the concert can begin thank you for for your attention if you have some questions i will be gladly to answer you thank you Thank you very much, Antonio. It's very interesting stuff. Uh, I would like to introduce Daria Zhurkova, one of my colleagues from our research group who, has, uh, who uh, started the question about uh, recycling of socialist heritage in uh, post-Soviet Russia. Daria, uh, uh, focuses on uh, music in our project and her paper 
the, uh, is devoted to the same subject that is music and music and something uh, everything what uh, concerns music here uh, she is uh, she is um, phd doctor yeah yeah uh, yeah for state institute for art studies yeah hello dear colleagues uh, thank you, Valeria Yuch. I'm really glad to take part in this fascinating conference, and I a little bit, uh, a little bit change the title of my report. Now it sounds like a musician of the past in contemporary Russian biopics, integration of Western and Eastern dramatic models. So. Uh, the Soviet past and its thinking make up an impressive part of the content of contemporary Russian mass media. Uh, the most popular, actively created and discussed form of media retromania is fiction films and series about the heroes of the Soviet era. According to researchers' estimates, more than 90 retro series were released on Channel One alone between 2000 and 2010 and today this trend is still on the rise. In this stream of media retro narratives, biopics form is distinct gender. Film adaptations of biographies of real, fictional and semi-fictional heroes of the past. Along with the members of government, eminent scholars, sportsmen and those engaged in the great economy, Soviet pop artists become extremely popular biopic prototypes. Over the past couple of decades on Russian television, there have been released at least 12 TV series dedicated to the careers of popular singers and singing film actors, those uh, performers whose work was extricably linked with popular music in the Soviet era. In my report, I would like to analyze contemporary Russian biopics about Soviet pop musicians in terms of their dual position. On the one hand, those series are influenced by the Hollywood, Hollywood uh, conventions of the musical biopic genre. On the other hand, retro series work with the historical and cultural heritage of Soviet era, which is extremely difficult to shape according to the laws of the commercial entertainment industry. In order to look into the collision and interaction of those opposing tendencies, I will refer to the concept of psycho and social biographies developed by the Polish researcher Eva Mazerska. Based on the concept, uh, based on the concept, I will analyze dramatic strategies of two series about Polish singers who became famous on Soviet stage. Those series are Anna German, uh, The Secret of White Angel, and Starborn, uh, Rajdone Zvizdoy, with the um, elements of Edita Piecha biography. Uh, in her research of biopics about popular Polish musicians, Eva Mazerska distinguished two types of dramatic models. Western film adaptation focus on the personality and of the artist going through some difficult times in his or her life. Representation of artists on the Western screen, Mazerska writes, often emphasize their exceptional qualities, genius, conflict with the external world, and misfortune, as opposite to the historical circumstances under which they develop their art. Following Griselda Pollock, Mazerska defines that Hollywood like dramatic model as a psychobiography. Uh, uh, sorry. Oh. No, no. Um, unlike Western biopics, screen adaptations of biographies in socialist countries are determined as a social biographies. In such films, Mazerska notes, artists are not soft from history, but fully integrated into it. This is especially the case in film made during the hegemony of socialist realism, when filmmakers were required to focus on a typical woman. In other words, social biographies imply that the fate of an artist is determined uh, not so much by his or her individual will, as by the time and environment in which he or she lived. Uh, that concept uh, works of, for the most uh, of the Soviet biopics. However, it has undergone a massive transformation since the late uh, 1970s. Um, in 1978, the film The Woman Who Sing with Al Pugachev was released uh, on Soviet screen. 
after the phenomenal box office success of this movie, biopics starring other popular singers appeared. There are The Soul with Sofia Rataro and Start from the Beginning with Andrei Makarevich. All three movies use dramatic techniques uh, that were not typical to the Soviet biographical, uh, biographical film and therefore did not fit into the social biography model. Their stories in many ways followed the structural model of the studio era of Hollywood musical biopic proposed by Bruce Bebington and Peter William Evans. Uh, first step uh, is rise, uh, second conflict and or afflica uh, affliction, uh, third retirement and comeback, and uh, the last one success and reconciliation. Moreover, those films were entirely focused on the individuality of their characters and in fact did not deal with the historical concept, uh, context of um, their work. Thus, uh, they can be categorized as the psychobiographies. Uh, starting from the mid-1980s, uh, in USSR, social biographies were represented by films about rock musicians rebelling against the system. The Burglar, Zlomshik and Asa became two iconic films of that type. Uh, thus, in the late Soviet musical biopic, the hegemony of the social biography dramatic model was lost. The films The Woman Who Sings the Soul Start from the Beginning are primarily focused on the individuality of their main characters, on their personal drama, which means that uh, the features of a psychobiography prevail in them. Uh, us and the Belgar uh, are a collective portrait of the perestroika generation, and they can be completely identified with the genre of social biography. Uh, the uh, division reveals a certain paradox. In Soviet musical biopics that are more conformist to the official regime, Hollywood so standards are much more evident than in films uh, whose heroes oppose the paternalistic system. In other words, uh, the more innovative and explosive in content the film is, the more dramatically socialist it appears. In relation to modern Russian biopic series about Soviet pop stars, the concept of psycho and social biographies is still valid. However, its content is significantly uh, transformed. It quite it's quite natural that the Hollywood conventions of musical biographic genre are now openly embodied and established in uh, the Russian film industry. Uh, that's why the producers take an active interest in artists managing uh, the challenging realities uh, of uh, life. For example, in the biography of Valery Abadzinsky, his addiction to drugs is empathized. The biography of Lyudmila Gurchenko focuses. Uh, the biography of Lyudmila Gurchenko focuses on a series on unsuccessful marriages, and a difficult financial situation caused by a um, temporary lack of her engagement in cinema. In the double biography of Lyubov Arlova and Grigory Alexandrov, their complex uh, sort of love triangle with Stalin is reconstructed. One thing is certain, though, in the overwhelming majority of musical biopics, uh, the main focus on the narrative is on the popular singer's private lives and love affairs. That is, uh, there is an obvious uh, priority of the uh, Hollywood psychobiography model. At the same time, the social biography model does not disappear completely. It's rather reinterpreted. Uh, the model intends to show how major historical events influence the life of the popular artists. That panorama is to be found in series that cover most of their hero's life. Secondly, the elements of social biography are present in almost all Russian uh, retro series because uh, their main leitmotif is uh, uh, the hero's conflict with the state authorities. To prop up my observation with specific example, I would like to analyze two series, two, two TV series. There are distinct similar, uh, similarities in uh, the origin and uh, fate of their main characters, but at the same time, the ways those movies work with the models of psych and social biographies are completely different. Uh, 
the main characters of both of the series are singers of Polish origin who became famous on the Soviet stage. The series Anna German, The Secrets of the White Angel, filmed, as the name suggests, the biography of the Polish singer Anna German. While the main prototype for the series Starborn was Edita Piecha, the Soviet pop singer. A few important clarifications need to be made. While the creators of the biopic about Anna German tended to stick to the facts and even ask her relatives to, for, assist, for assistance, the series Starborn is semi-fictional biopic, or also called uh, film with a K. Its creators have been working on the collective image of the main character based on the biographies of few Soviet pop singers at once. To avoid direct parallels, the, the authors gave the character a made-up name, Claudia Caval. In both of the series, the main dramatic conflict has the features of psychobiography and it's built around the position of singer's career and their, their love relationships. In Starborn, this conflict uh, is intensified by the fact that the main character marries uh, the artistic director of the band, in which she is a soloist. Interestingly, uh, both characters did not initially strive for a singing career, never studied music, and if by chance ended up on the big stage. Despite the similarities in the input information, the series differ in terms of the relationship to time and its historical and dramatic dimensions. Uh, the series about Anna German covers the period from the late 1930s to the early 1980s and follows the fortunes uh, of the heroine from childhood to her death uh, through the prism of historical events. For example, the main character's father falls a victim to the Great Terror. Her mother and grandmother are forced to hide their true origin uh, and flee from uh, persecution during the Second World War. And employee of the NKVD personifies the repressive state system and becomes a personal persecutor for the family. He appears at uh, the size of moments uh, and largely determines both the personal fate and the professional career of the protagonist. Thus, uh, the series accumulates a social biographical dramatic model, adding historical uh, events into the fate of the main character, making common and private histories inseparable uh, from each other. Uh, the narrative of Starborn series covers um, a relatively short period, uh, period of time, just about from the mid uh, 1950s to the late 1960s. The two main characters, Love Affair, is a central, central of the plot and has nothing to do with the political events of the time. Uh, the, uh, the authorities are shown as a faceless officials who constantly find fault uh, with the main characters and prevent them from realizing their talents to the fullness. Um, they are not an irresistible and almighty force, but rather an annoying nonsense that the creators of the series need, uh, in, uh, needed in order to simulate intrigue. Thus, in the series, there prevails a psychobiography model with the historical context as a merely decorative background for a costume melodrama. As a part of my research, I also analyzed how psycho and social biography models work on the series soundtracks. On the one hand, I have looked into the how songs in the series relate to the dramatic collision of the episode in which they appear. On the other hand, I have studied the relationship between external and internal themes uh, for how the soundtracks, uh, for how the soundtracks, how many songs that sound are dev devoted to universal civic uh, values and uh, deeply personal experience. Due to time concentrates, I'll only summarize my findings. Uh, the soundtracks in the series about Anna German are rather social biographical. The songs become, first of all, the symbol of the time when the singer lived, but not the embodiment of her personal drama. Uh, 
They certainly bring additional meanings to the plot of the series, but they generalize rather than specify the dramatic intention of the creators of the series. The creators of uh, Starborn series also very actively accumulate the historical genome of the Soviet hits, uh, yet they do it in a completely different way. Uh, they used about 10 well-known uh, song, uh, songs of the Soviet era created by various composers as soundtracks. But in the series, all those hits are assumed to be composed by one main character, uh, the artistic director of the band. That is, on the one hand, uh, the music environment of Epoch is fully and convincingly reconstructed. On the other hand, there is opportunity to rewrite the history of those song creation. And in the series, um, the stories of many songs reflected, uh, reflect uh, the characters' lives, especially their love experience. Thus, uh, the music selection of uh, the series is also adjust, uh, adjusted to the fit the psychobiography model. Uh, regarding the repertoire of the soundtrack, the characters of both of the series do not perform distinctly patriotic songs. Uh, also, in the series about Anna Germa, they appear as a musical symbols of certain uh, historical events. In both series, there are as many songs fascinating the outside world and dedicated to certain universal human values as the dedicated to personal intimates, uh, intimate often love experience. But even deeply personal feelings are presented in a decent, uh, relatively restrained, uh, restrained form. There is no emotional order. Thus, in terms of repertoire, the series maintains a balance in interaction of psycho and social biography. Uh, now I think I'm stop. And uh, okay, well, thank you for your attention. Yeah. Yeah, I, yes, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. I have some technical problems with my computer or, okay. or, or maybe with, <laughs> with my hands. Sorry uh -huh. about uh -huh. this. Uh, everything okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dasha. Thank you very much for your brilliant talk. And uh, there is a time for your question, dear, dear participants, dear guests. Okay, I see that uh, Katriona was the first who. Uh, ask your question, uh, your question. Thank you very much, uh, um, and, and thank you very much to all of the panelists for terrific presentations. I have actually a, a question to Daria, I mean, simply because I work on the Soviet cinema. Um, and um, one observation, there was no official ca ca category of biopic, as I'm sure you know, in the Soviet cinema. It was um, actually these were if they were about Lenin, they were historica revolutionia uh, filmy. Um, if they were about, um, you know, famous artists, then they would be sort of in a film about a famous artist. I mean, in, in other words, that this is a retrospective ca categorization. There's no problem at all with that because you're saying something very interesting about the Hollywoodization of late so of Soviet cinema, which is indeed assiduously cultivated by the film managers of that period, particularly Philippe Yarmash. So this becomes a really big objective in the Soviet cinema at that period. But I've got a couple of questions. And the first question is, how um, self-conscious do you think that current Russian filmmakers are about the Hollywood tradition? Because it's very clear that they're extremely self-conscious about pastiche, Soviet pastiche at some level, usually not in a very cinematically aware way. I mean, in other words, they're not actually using film techniques, it's more the clothes, the mise-en-scene, I mean, you know, sort of various kind of superficial elements like that, but there is a sort of sign of that they are dealing with this in a, an ironic way, so it's sort of, you know, it's, um, it's sort of stiob, um, you could say. Do you, would you say there was a similar attitude towards the, soft, the Hollywood um, cin cinema? I mean, I w wondered, for example, about, is that title, A Star is Born, just a, a really big cliche? Um, yeah. Do they really not know that it's been a cliche for um, so long that now a star is torn, which is the sort of alternative title, is also a cliche? Um, or is this being done in a very self-aware way? I mean, there is, after all, a very literate film audience um, in post 
Soviet Russia, and actually particularly about Western films. Um, and um, equally, I'm just, you know, you're probably not gonna have time to answer all this, but I wondered about relations with the serious biopic, in particular, for example, Siryevnikov's Lyata, um, or Summer, which is of course, um, not such an alternative biopic as all that, but it is a very good film. I mean, you know, it's a sort of, it's not even art house, it's just a kind of, you know, really creative film with the exception of the disastrous casting of the female lead who is far too Instagram to kind of you know, fit the sort of general context. But I mean, you know, it's an, an interesting attempt. So those are the two questions. Are people, are, are people um, self-aware about Hollywood conventions? And, you know, what do you do given the saturation of the market? I mean, how can you possibly make a creative film um, mm -hmm. using the biopic mode at the moment? Um, I mean, you know, Siebrink of almost manages, but it's not that easy. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your questions. Yeah, I, I tried to answer. Uh, of course, um, uh, first of all, uh, I think you know that uh, the Soviet biographical, historical biographical film and the Hollywood biographical film uh, in uh, uh, the in the beginning of uh, this uh, genre was very um, enough, uh, was enough, um, has, um, I would say, um, very similar in some ways. Yeah. Uh, so um, now, uh, yeah, uh, creators of biopics try to uh, how embodied these uh, conventions of Hollywood. And uh, of course they, mm, uh, they, they, but they have no irony and pastiche because uh, it's a Soviet past. And in, uh, I think uh, now it's not so um, ironically uh, represented uh, at, in the media because it's a uh, political questions, uh, especially uh, at Russian TV. Because uh, no, uh, uh, letter is uh, not for TV, uh, yeah, uh, pro production. Uh, so it's more, it's, I think it's, um, yeah, uh, it's art uh, video, it's art movie letter, I, I mean. And so uh, Starborn is, of course, uh, it's, uh, a very mass uh, market product yeah, and it's quite um i'd say um, uh, it's uh, it's quite a soap um opera in terms of soviet estrada i i can just uh, determine it like that yeah, yeah if i <laughs> catch your uh, question. Yeah. Thank you, Dasha. Uh, Rita, please, your question. Uh, thank you, um, Valeria, and, and, and everyone for uh, absolutely fascinating papers. I also have uh, a question for Daria, and I'm kind of picking, I want to piggyback on what Katriana said and, and sort of ask you a bit more about this designation of the bi biopic, specifically in the Soviet era movies uh, that you mentioned and just the, this idea of biography, right? Because, um, and this is something that I, that I of course worked on in, um, uh, in my writing as well. So the, the films like Jenshina Katoraya Payot, Dusha, Nachni Snachala, uh, these were all basically, basically P Soviet era PR projects to establish uh, these cultural figures um, on kind of the mass plane, right? And also all of them, you know, like um, uh, in Dusha, it's uh, Victoria Svobodina, and Nachni Snachala, it's Nikolai Kvalyov. All of these are fictional characters, right? And I know that when Jenshin um, Katroya Payot was being made, uh, Pugacheva's husband at the time, Stefanovich, basically said, let's put all of these biographical details about you that kind of um, Imagine, yeah. reflect, yeah, that kind of reflect your life a little bit, but not really, right? Uh, just so we, so we get uh, viewer interest, right? Spectator interest. So that's, so maybe you can kind of talk about uh, this idea of the biopic or the biography, right? Because most of these uh, characters 
you know, of course, people knew Pugacheva, but this movie really, really placed her into that position of huge celebrity, right? After the movie came out, she, uh, I think she was voted uh, best actress in Sovietsky Ekran. And then mm-hmm. I, I want to uh, talk about a little bit about Asa uh, and uh, the burglar, right? So with Asa, who is it a biopic of, right? If we're going to talk about Asa being a biopic, the only biography, you know, the only historical figure, mm-hmm. well, I would say that it's actually a biopic of Paul the First themselves, right? Because that's an actual historical drama that unfolds throughout the entire, uh, the entire uh, narrative of the, um, of the film, right? It's certainly not a biopic of Soy, right? Soy shows up in the last seven minutes, sings a song, and, that, and that's it. Of course, that's what people remember him uh, for, and I'll talk about that in just uh, an hour or so. Um, and then in terms of uh, the burglar, again, right, you have kinship, but this is more of a late Soviet youth and kind of coming of age movie about his little brother, Simeon, right? Kinship, it, it kind of plays a supporting role there. So anyway, so these are just some ideas that I've had, and this is the first time that I've heard these movies uh, be referred to as biopics, and I would love to hear what you have to say. Thank you. I think, yeah, uh, you, <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, it's not uh, biopic in uh, abs- as an absolute gen, but the elements of biopic in those films, yeah? Um, and I think in also the uh, uh, sort of character is Bonanan, and he's uh, like, uh, not, uh, um, not absolutely a musician, but he is a musician. And uh, uh, there are a lot of people who play music around him. Yeah? Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the Victor Tsoi who just uh, stepped by him <laughs> yeah, uh, when he died. So uh, I think uh, it's, um, of course, it's n- not uh, um, uh, clear biopic, I would say, yeah, but with elements of biopics. Uh, and uh, what about uh, the other uh, woman who sings, uh, yeah, and other, uh, the soul, uh, and start from the beginning? Uh, uh, that's, uh, this film's, of, of course, <laughs> not, not biopic uh, in uh, this way, what we, we mean now of this genre, but uh, the same they have elements of bi- biography of their characters. And of course, uh, that's why, uh, because uh, the star, star is the pop star, uh, with, uh, which star in here, uh, there. So they, I think uh, they, uh, uh, rep- uh, yeah, audience think that it's biopic uh, about these uh, characters. Thank you. Uh, Anna, your question, please. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, I, actually, I will continue this topic, of course, because it's also, <laughs> as I, you know, I, was, <laughs> I feel like a star. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can. <laughs> yeah, as, uh, I think that one of the main uh, difference between films I was presenting two days ago, uh, uh-huh. Letta is one of them, uh, from uh, those two um, examples that you um, presented, that actually uh, in those series we see kind of the way of uh, each of uh, the characters, yeah, and Anna German and the other future pop star from the moment that they are completely unknown from the childhood in case of Anna German until the moment of death again with Anna German or till the moment when they are actually becoming a real pop star. In case of Leta, we don't see this world from the beginning till the end. There have some elements with Toy, of course, but uh, as the main character, we don't have Toy, we have Mike, who is already a star and it's not the main um, purpose of the plot to show this road and the same was with the thoughts given we see him that he is already a star and it's not this classical Hollywood uh, form when we uh, see the road how this person actually be- became so important for the audience for the, it, it's, it's just the fact it the commonplace even you can say it yeah for for everyone and for the audience that's the obvious fact that that is a fact that is taken for granted 
uh, so just some thoughts. And my question was, uh, do you uh, think that uh, in those examples, the fact that those singers are from Poland, yes, from one of the um, countries from uh, uh, socialist countries? Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they are making their career in the Soviet Union in Moscow, and that is kind of the most significant moment in uh, uh, their life, in their mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the career. Uh, is it important somehow to show, you know, the Moscow how, uh, as a center of this whole uh, mm -hmm. sphere? Or, and uh, maybe there are some other aliens, like uh, Italians in Anna German, who are actually mm -hmm. evil there, because mm -hmm. Polish producers are not evil, R Russian producers are not evil, but Italian, they want only money, they want to somehow mm -hmm. um, to uh, not good <laughs> for her. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that will be my question. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anna. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, I think it's um, uh, another uh, way because uh, they um, not uh, do the Moscow or the center of the pop, <laughs> pop uh, stage, but um, they show the uh, both character as a worldwide star. Uh, whole world, whole world style. Yeah, um, uh, they they have um, a universal career. Of course, German uh, sing at Australian, yeah, uh, Italian, and Ru in Russian, in Polish, and so on. And uh, uh, Claudia Caval from Starborn um, have. Um, and the engage, uh, was engagement to uh, Sweden, yeah, uh, and uh, and so, uh, but she didn't sing in Polish. It's strange, but yeah. Uh, so I think it's uh, other way uh, of um, uh, presentation of singer uh, that uh, the Ra Soviet uh, singers w uh, have ha had and a worldwide uh, career, something like that, yeah. Thank you very much, Dasha, and Arkadiusz, for whom your question is. <laughs> Please, to, we, we cannot hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. It's maybe not a question, but rather a general uh, conclusion. Uh, because I wonder why biopics are popular uh, in our society at all, because uh, this is not only connected with the pop singer and so on, uh, but also with you can not in, and not only the films and TV series, because you can buy a biography of uh, Ronaldo, Messi, uh, Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, and uh, every stars of of every. A kind of stars, every politician uh, printed and, and edited uh, some kind of uh, memoirs or something like that. Uh, I, I wonder, it's uh, what you see, what you think. It's connected with the you know, social media uh, culture or something like that, because uh, the popularity of, of bio biographies uh, in, in uh, very wide meaning. Uh, for me, is uh, one of the um, of the question mark for for <laughs> this time. Why uh, these bi biographies will, are uh, still uh, so popular in, in any kind? Uh, it's not only I think that not only the Russian or, or post-Soviet uh, idea because we, we've got uh, the same factor, the same. A trend in, in uh, Western culture. So it's maybe not the question, but uh, uh -huh. but something. That's opinion. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. If you, you want much. to comment, of course. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Arkadiusz. I have a question. I also have a questions, and um, I would like to notice that we. I, I understand Daria is a star, of course, but we had three brilliant papers before Daria uh, presented her 
paper. And uh, I have two questions to all the speakers who presented their papers before that. Uh, but I, I have some introduction. I, I need some introduction for this. First of all, I would like to share my, my uh, uh, screen with you. Please be patient. Here is a very, very, very important, a well-known person. And now I would like to read the title of this, uh, of this photo picture. Pablo Picasso, with the revolver, he would carry loaded with blanks, which he would shoot at people who ask about the meaning of his painting, 1950. Uh, Eight. And uh, this is about meaning of not uh, Picasso's painting, but uh, for all um, presenters who uh, presented uh, their papers before Daria, I, I have two questions. One of them, what these artists do want? What do they want? What is their message? I do not understand. I feel I don't I, I I know nothing about music, of course. But uh, as a ordinary people, ordinary person, uh, just listener, just uh, spectator, uh, uh, I always ask about this. Uh, I cannot avoid this question, this strange and frightening question. For instance, when I concern with uh, totalitarian art in any form, it is frightening for me what they want to terrify me by their art or not? This is first question uh, about message. Another question is about context. Maybe you told about this in, uh, in your papers. I, I, I could miss this, but uh, um, please repeat it for summarizing uh, something about this. Um, is there, are there some equivalents in other countries to the, to the phenomenon uh, which you described in, the, in your papers? Uh, we talk a lot about uh, uh, universality and uniqueness of the um, recycling in, in um, contemporary, contemporary cultural situation. Please comment something about uh, something on this matter also. Uh, Thank you very much. That is to my question. And I would like to stop sharing my screen and return to you. Oops. Here I am. Please start your question. Uh, please. Do you hear me? Ah, Irena, please. Okay. Um, to answer your question about uh, whether there were comparable examples uh, of, uh, I believe you asked me about NSK, non Slovenian Kunst, uh, whether there were comparable examples in other countries throughout the socialist or post-socialist realm, not that I'm aware of. Uh, maybe I'm making a huge mistake here, but uh, I don't think that uh, you can't really compare these phenomena because uh, each situation is highly specific. And uh, I was trying to explain in this presentation that Slovenia had a very particular um, history and uh, very uh, particular um, cultural context uh, that uh, Leibach and the NSK were responding to. And uh, I don't really see um, any meaningful uh, platform for um, comparing um, them or um, anything uh, that might uh, vaguely resemble what they do in other um, countries because simply each country had a very specific and uh, different situation. There was certainly nothing, anything like them going on in former Yugoslavia, not in Croatia, not in Serbia, um, anywhere else. 
and I'm pretty sure that uh, um, anything uh, similar was uh, going on elsewhere. But uh, then again, we have to really set up um, meaningful criteria for comparison. So um, I, do, I, I really don't know if this answers your question, but uh, I think that uh, it's important to uh, make uh, platforms for comparison. And I see uh, this conference as such as uh, an attempt to do precisely this. I was personally hoping uh, to, to hear uh, at this conference more examples from um, Africa, Cuba, or I mentioned North Korea, but uh, 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 places outside of the post-Soviet uh, realm. And uh, hmm, maybe, maybe um, we'll discover new things that uh, we are not uh, aware of at the present, but I think uh, that uh, NSK were pretty much quite unique. Thank you very much for your answer. Monica, please. Um, uh, I agree with uh, um, Irena. Uh, I think that uh, every country has its uh, peculiarities and its way to uh, recycle and revisit uh, um, uh, Soviet and uh, socialist ideology. As regards Italy and uh, the, the band, uh, um, uh, on which I uh, focused, uh, I think that they uh, their goal was to um, uh, remember a world uh, in some way easier than uh, the actual one, in which uh, um, uh, they have the sense to be on the right side of the history, uh, because we in Italy have uh, fascism. So on the other side, there is the um, the right way of being of uh, of live but uh, um, after uh, the story says that uh, the truth uh, the truth uh, wasn't on the other side but in something in uh, between uh, that uh, um, and maybe in the tenderness in the irony they used to speak about uh, um, this is a socialist dream uh, in uh, in the center of uh, of um, in central italy uh, it's a, um, uh, it's a way to uh, um, declare that the ideology is uh, is over, and it's uh, um, and we can uh, all uh, the, the only thing we have uh, um, after years of uh, struggles uh, and. Um, uh, I, I would like to remember that in Italy in, in the end of the 70s, there was a terrorism, a red terrorism and a black terrorism. Uh, so um, it's like that uh, uh, after the end of violence of uh, uh, ideology, all we have uh, in uh, our hands uh, is um, a, a sort of a um, ghost or simulacrum of what uh, was a, a, a Soviet ideology, but also a, um, fascist ideology. And, uh, uh, and they are remembered just as a, um, a, teen, uh, a teen dream, a teen, a teen idea of a future in which uh, uh, maybe uh, social justice in some way will win. So, Thank I you very I much, it. Monica. Thank you very much. Antonio, please comment on this question if you can. Okay. Thank you, Valerie, for your questions. Uh, what do artists want? Uh, well, and the context, uh, but for me, what was really interesting, this, uh, you said that you're terrified of art. And this is what this art of Laiba, mostly about Laiba, also brought in Yugoslavia. It was absolutely unique phenomenon, which had its political background because the Slovenian party officials, you know, Stane Dolans from the early 80s, try to make a democratic movement in, a, in, in Slovenia when in Belgrade there was a rise of nationalism because of the Kosovo crisis in the 80s. So Leibach did not, and Neue Slovenische Kunst didn't happen. It, it was, let's say, produced by the uh, party oligarchy, uh, which was seeing where the Yugoslavia was going. So there were also, 
always some kind of political background of them, and there was also some kind of protection, not just Laibach, but uh, Neue Slovenische Kunst and Mladina, their youth, uh, youth magazine. So this is uh, really interesting because they were like, let's say, some kind of a, a, a oracles, you know, uh, in 1983, uh, they, Leibach made a, 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 a song called The State. And in this song, they quoted a Tito spoke, uh, Tito, Yossi uh, Bros Tito, uh, famous sentence. We have spilled an ocean of blood for the brotherhood and unity of our peoples. And we shall not allow anyone to touch or destroy it from within. So they were, they were tr trying to say what will happen. And they were like uh, oracles, you know, some partly conscious, partly subconscious oracles, what will happen in Yugoslavia. But they were not the only one. There is also Borgesia. You probably haven't heard. It was also banned. It was not part of the Neue Slovenische Kunst. They also had a song, you know, you, they wore uniforms and they are dead, you know. So there was a really this kind of method. Slovenia was the most democratic, most liberal part of Yugoslavia. And it produces the most totalitarian and most uh, military, militarized uh, art because it was, let's say, mirroring what was what was happening in Belgrade and what was uh, and what will happen in in Yugoslavia. So uh, they had this uh, uh, terrified uh, aspect to it. You know, their art is really because it was uh, terrifying. They were talking about something which nobody believed. That will happen. In the same time, in Yugoslavia, mostly Bosnian, uh, Bosnian musicians, let's say like Lepa Brena, she is a folk, folk song uh, singer who was singing uh, the po most popular song, "I Am from the Yugoslavia," I'm, I'm Yugoslavian girl, something like that, and she 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 uh, sang this song in front of fifty thousand people. Later, she she, uh, she married uh, one tennis star. There was a Bielo Dugme and Plavi Orchestra. They were all from Bosnia and Herzegovina. You know, the Plavi Orchestra has a song, Don't, don't Be a Fascist. So it is really interesting because um, the Neue Slovenische Kunst uh, had some terrifying aspect to it, but it was just mirroring what is politically happening. And it is, I think, for me, um, everything they done after the 90s, it lost uh, its background because the, the, the mirror was broken. There was not this mirroring mm -hmm. about the context this is what really interesting because i also think this uh, is happening in in in, in from for liba it's unique context in the 80s in, in yugoslavia which was trying to collapse but also this new um, uh, new concept on a socialist realist monuments which are happening now in the last years this is really interesting because the croatia itself is was partly emerged in this Hungarian, also in Slovenia and Poland, this traditional uh, na nationalistic uh, uh, way of doing politics. And it was really um, suppressing its, its, its uh, anti-fascist uh, uh, ideas from the Second World War. Uh, probably you don't know, but the, the Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Herzegovina has a strong uh, anti-fascist movement and we were liberated by ourselves. You know, we were not liberated by the Red Army and occupied like yes. in Hungary on Czech Republic. So uh, our tradition is different and uh, our stance toward anti-fascism is different. So this, uh, these concerts are also some kind of, of, uh, of lighthouse, which is uh, trying to put the light on a new movement, you know, in Zagreb. Now in new elections, the new, new, uh, new mayor is a left party. Uh, uh, and so... This context is very interesting, and these concerts which are happening in these monuments, socialist realist monuments, are really, and they are happening now in this uh, when the whole area around Croatia, you know, like uh, in, in Serbia, there is autocratic power, autocratic power in Orban in north, in autocratic in Slovenia is autocratic, Bosnia and Herzegovina is in almost perpetuating preparation for the war, so everything is really, really let's say politically very dark. And so you have this kind of, uh, some kind of um, trying to repeat what Leibach did, you know, try to warn, you know, some, something, something is happening. We have to, you know, uh, reor reorient ourselves because things could be, you know, disastrous.
Thank you, Valery. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for your answer. Uh, for your answers, answers. Uh, I would like to say that uh, um, this is a confession, and I would like to say that listening our discussion during the first two days, uh, sometimes I uh, thought that uh, what we are talking about, all the same, all the same in Poland, in Russia, we have a lot of similar phenomenon. But now we, we see that they, everything is different. It is also important to not, do not ignore uh, uh, uniqueness of the situation as well as uh, perhaps uh, some un universal uh, features which we can uh, notice in the cultural situation. Thank you very much for your uh, answers. Uh, dear colleagues, some more questions. Or comments. Okay. Uh, maybe just uh, one sentence. Uh, Please, Irena. Uh, I said that uh, live uh, not really comparable to anything else, but uh, what I actually meant is that. We can compare some aspects of their work uh, to other artistic uh, movements, uh, groups, phenomena, etc. Certainly, there is a, a, a platform for comparison with uh, some uh, segments of the Russian art scene. But uh, I meant that I don't think that anyone has. Um, uh, combined uh, this uh, pop cultural uh, like global uh, presence uh, with uh, with uh, let's say a career in in the art field in the art world so uh, in that terms I think they're quite uh, unique but of, of course all these phenomena need really careful reading and careful study to to be able to draw meaningful conclusions by comparing mm -hmm. them. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I, I would like to say to a couple of words about uh, the Antonio's presentation. Uh, this is, but it, this does not concern uniqueness. Uh, this uh, concerns general situation with uh, the notion cultural recycling. As I noticed reading a lot of books about cultural recycling during perhaps two years already, I have noticed one very important thing. There are two tendencies, two trends in um, attempts to understand or explain what does it mean cultural recycling. And this trends not about the meaning of the phenomenon or notion. This is uh, attempts to, to evaluate ethically what it is. Is it bad or is it good to recycle something? This is a very important question when we are talking about this phenomenon, which does not concern uh, interpretation. This is just ethical, moral question. Uh, for instance, if we talk about recycling in, in uh, later capitalism, it is very bad. If we talk about, for instance, uh, about avant-garde, it is not so bad, different points of view. But there is another uh, middle way to think about uh, recycling. Do not think about these questions at all. Just do, just recycle. And Antonian's presentation show this uh, way very clear. Uh, artists just uh, take monuments and just use it in another way. And they do art like this. This is neutral position. It's very, very sympathetic for me. I like it very much. And uh, when I understood to this point, uh, uh, artists can and will be recycle another art. It was fascinating uh, discovery for me. Thank you very much, Antonio. You remind me of this discovery. <laughs> one Spasiba, more time. Valeri. Spasiba, Valeri. But I would like to take uh, one very important thing. There is no art which is not recycle something. You know, because we are always standing on a levels and levels, layers of layers of history, of, of symbolism, of a, of a cult, human cultural 
for, for hundreds of years. So uh, the question is all just, are you recycling consciously or are you recycling unconsciously? And this is the only question because you cannot make art without recycling. And this is, oh. this is, this is all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Spasiba Ant Valeri. Spasiba Valeri. Antonio, I, 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 don't, I will try to answer you shortly. Where This is another uh, side of uh, interpretation of concept uh, recycling, cultural recycling. Is this the, uh, the phenomenon of the last day or it is universal, you know, um, general phenomenon. If we talk about uh, cultural recycling as a universal phenomenon, it is good. If we talk about uh, recycling of the last day, this is a sort of apocalypse. This is another uh, trend, two trends which uh, uh, correlate, correlate one, one with another. I tried to explain this position in my uh, last uh, um, article, which did not published yet, but perhaps I hope will be. Uh, thank you very much. Dear colleagues, if we have no any question or comments, we should, we can stop our discussion in order to return, uh, uh, to, return uh, to our discussion in a half of hour. Thank you very much for your attention. We are waiting you for another panel, for next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.